You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm Pooh. And I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, my dear. And thank you so much. I thought you were never going to come back and say the pledge ever again. I didn't know that either. Well, you just took a little holiday, huh? Probably. Okay. Oh, a break. <laughs> okay. I'll come in and tuck you in later. All right, bye. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is another first for the hour of the time. As you know, I always do my own research, cite my own sources, and give you the findings therefrom. I've only deviated from that twice in the history of the Hour of the Time, once for Perspective, or excuse me, Perceptions Magazine, and for Backwards Home Magazine, both of which I highly recommend, because amongst all of the other things, there are great kernels of truth and methods of becoming self-sufficient and understanding those with whom you normally do not associate. I think that's important because part of the tactic of the enemy is to divide and conquer. So where you look around and you see your neighbor as your enemy because you have been taught to believe that way or television tells you that or something happens that you read that you are not supposed to associate with that kind of person. Usually when you break through all of those boundaries, artificial boundaries, if you will, you'll find that they're just people like you trying to make a living like everybody else. And that these barriers and these animosities and these Problems are built intentionally to divide us in order to conquer us. Tonight I'm going to read an article to you from Relevance magazine. It's uh, one of my favorites. And uh, I think the introduction that I gave to tonight's broadcast should tell you how important that is. Philip O'Halloran, who is the editor of Relevance Magazine, is a personal friend of mine. In my recent trip to the state of Michigan uh, for my speaking engagement, I had an opportunity to sit down and have dinner with Philip uh, and Connie uh, and, and many other people from Michigan who are important people, who are patriots, who care about this country, who care about God, and uh, who are fighting to prevent the loss of freedom for all peoples, no matter race, religion, or place of ancestral origin. So I'm going to read you this article from Relevance Magazine tonight. And I'm going to tell you how to subscribe to this magazine right now. You can call 1-800-626-8944. That's 1-800-626-8944. one 626 8944 Once again, one 800 Six two six eight nine four four. A year subscription is $110, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the very best publication that you can subscribe to in this world is Veritas Newspaper, a full-size newspaper. And uh, a lot of the articles that are written in relevance uh, appear previously as headline articles in Veritas Newspaper not word for word, not written by the same people, and not researched by the same people. So it's not exactly the same article. But you always get it first from Veritas. Now, whether you get it first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, Relevance Magazine is one of the best places to get any information that you can get because the research is impeccable. The writing is excellent. And as you hear tonight, it's going to hold you 
on the edge of your seat. And you're going to begin to understand through this article some of the things that have been happening. And we're going to stick with Relevance Magazine for this week. And if I don't finish with this article tonight, I will continue tomorrow night. On Friday, April 26th, agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms arrested the leader of the Georgia Republic Militia and an associate on the charge of conspiring, quote, to possess unregistered explosive devices, or more specifically, pipe bombs. Naturally, the disturbing news was splashed across the nation and even made international headlines. When CBS News claimed, and listen very closely, ladies and gentlemen, that the militiamen had plotted to use the bombs in a terrorist act aimed at the upcoming Olympics in Atlanta. In a May 6th preliminary hearing held in Macon, Georgia, the two defendants, Robert E. Starr III and William J. McCraney, were brought before U.S. Magistrate Richard L. Hodge. At this hearing, Starr's attorney, Dr. Nancy Lord, argued that BATF confidential informants who had infiltrated the small militia group had actually planted the bomb-making material themselves. This was broken as a headline story in Veritas magazine some months ago. In fact, within two or three weeks of the arrest of McCraney and Starr. The government's case is built on the premise that Starr and McCraney had conspired to build pipe bombs, and they were presented as evidence the fact that they had discovered, quote, bomb-making materials, end quote, buried in two locations in Crawford County, one where McCraney lives and another on land owned by Starr. According to militia members who have signed sworn affidavits, two men reputed to be the government's informants had discussed building the pipe bombs for home defense. The discussions occurred at an April 23rd militia meeting, after which several of the other militia members approached Starr and told him that they were opposed to the bombing, bomb-making plan discussed by the two men. They contend that Starr reassured them that he had no intention of going along with the two informants' plan. As for McCraney, the Macon, Georgia Telegraph of May 7th exposed a critical government admission revealed during the preliminary hearing. Pay very close attention, ladies and gentlemen. And I quote directly from the Macon, Georgia Telegraph of May 7th. Quote, Agent Stephen W. Gillis of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms also acknowledged that Starr's co-defendant, William James, Jimmy McCraney, had said, quote, I don't want to know anything about it, end quote, and walked away when the government's informant was talking about building bombs, end quote. Note, ladies and gentlemen, that the government informant was talking about building bombs, not Starr and not McCraney, which supports the defense's charge of entrapment. In fact, Starr's attorney, Nancy Lord, goes one step further. Lord, who was the 1992 Libertarian Party candidate for vice president, charged, quote, This is beyond entrapment. It is manufactured evidence. The materials were put on Mr. Starr's property without his knowledge. The whole evidence upon which this case was based was fraudulent, end quote. The revealing Macon Telegraph article continued, quote, a federal agent testified Monday that Starr was not present when alleged vice pipe bomb components were buried on his property. And the agent admitted that he did not know for sure whether Robert Edward Starr III was aware the materials were there, end quote. The Telegraph added that Dr. Lord accused the ATF's confidential informants of being sent in to infiltrate and set up the militia group. Quote, Lord said it was the agent provocateurs who actually buried the pipes and chemicals on Starr's property, which made it easy for agents to find them when they got a search warrant. She said, and I quote, you went right to it. You didn't have to search the whole 16 acres, did you? End quote, Lord asked. FBI agent Gillis conceded agents did not. They went exactly right 
to the specific spot. Lord had maintained that there is no conspiracy when all the participants but one are government agents, according to the Telegraph's Audrey Posta. Quote, Gillis had just testified that someone other than the government's informants had shown up to Mc McCraney's place the day the materials were to be moved to Starr's property, which would have met the legal definition of a conspiracy. When Lord asked Gillis whether this other militia member actually participated in moving the materials, Prosecutor Sharon Ratley objected, again citing the need to protect identities. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that there was no militia member. All of these materials were moved and buried at the specific sites by agents provocateurs of the United States government being paid to do so. If they had failed in doing so, they would not have been paid. Ratley objected repeatedly when Lord pressed Agent Gillis, asking him whether anyone other than Starr and the government's informants took part in discussions or activities concerning the pipe bombs. Ratley contended that the identities of the confidential informants, confidential informants, confidential informants would then be revealed, to which Lord countered, with all due respect, the identity has been revealed. The judge finally instructed Gillis to answer the question of whether this other militia member had actually participated. The alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agent admitted, quote, I don't know what the under, other individual did, end quote. In fact, Gillis's evidence was based on an ambiguous tape recording. Quote, the agent acknowledged that he had no way of knowing from the informant's tape recording whether the group was talking about bombs or survival gear when members talked about needing supplies, end quote. Nevertheless, federal agent Stephen Gillis appears content to help send two men to jail for many years on these disgracefully flimsy and quite probably manufactured charges. Ohio militia leader J.J. Johnson, who attended the trial and testified as a character witness for Starr, cited the following additional holes in the government's case as they were revealed by cross-examination of agent Gillis. One, Bob Starr did not want Bob ma bomb making materials on his property and did not have possession of any bomb making materials. Two, there never were any completed pipe bombs and the bomb making factory alluded to in media reports consisted of two small sandwich bags of legally obtainable chemicals such as sodium perchlorate powder, aluminum, and a clumpy white mixture not yet analyzed. After 10 days, this is number three, after 10 days, the chemicals found on Starr's property still had not been analyzed by any scientific laboratory. If, as the hearing's evidence suggests, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms informants planted the materials, there would be no need to test the chemicals. They would already know what they were. Four, government informants planted the evidence, the bomb-making material on Starr's property, and it has not yet been ascertained through chemical analysis that any of these chemicals, when put together, would actually make any bomb. How about that? Number five, McCraney was not at the meeting to discuss bomb-making and wanted nothing to do with making bombs. In fact, observers we interviewed had no idea why the man was even being held. As Johnson's wife, Helen, asked, quote, has it occurred to anyone that the wrong guys are in jail, end quote? But ladies and gentlemen, why didn't Starr simply say no to the illegal schemes and scuttle the whole thing right from the beginning? Well, Attorney Lord claims that her client had suspected a government setup and was attempting to determine who in his militia group had instigated the talk of bomb-making. He did not know whether it was the two men doing the talking or someone else, and was, according to Lord, conducting an internal investigation of the organization he founded. Lord insisted 
Mr. Starr was arrested not because he intended to build those bombs, but because he intended not to. In fact, the night after the meeting, where the alleged pipe bomb discussions occurred, Starr phoned in to the popular shortwave program of J.J. Johnson, himself a militia leader from Ohio. The tape is being used as evidence by the defense and has already been played to the court. Johnson told relevance that Starr alerted the listening audience to the kind of unscrupulous tactics to expect from federal law enforcement. He made specific reference to attempts by law enforcement to infiltrate groups with agents provocateurs who might then attempt to entrap or frame the group's members with illegal acts. Starr also told Johnson off the air that a friendly FBI acquaintance had warned him earlier that day of an anonymous threat against his, Starr's, life. It was for this reason that Starr decided to refer on the air to the federal entrapment tactics. Did Starr's comments prompt the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms to hurriedly set the hook on their sting operation? Well, the Telegraph article states, and I quote, Gillis confirmed the FBI said it had received the death threat against Starr. But he said there was no connection between Starr's calling the radio show and ATF's decision to get the warrants against Starr and McCraney the next day. End quote. And that's right. They obtained the arrest warrants the day after the Wednesday radio show and took the two into custody, custody the following day. Gadsden, Alabama militia leader Jeff Randall who, like Johnson, is a personal friend of Starr's, told Relevance, quote, Look at the chronology of events. The ATF admitted that they would have had a better case if they had waited until the components were assembled, end quote. That would have been on the Saturday when the alleged bomb-making session was to take place at Starr's property. Randall believes that the only reason the men were arrested earlier before they had any hard evidence, is that Starr's shortwave show tipped off the feds that he was on to their entrapment scheme. Randall added, quote, ATF admitted that the pipes had not even been fingerprinted and that the chemical was not tested to see if it would even explode, end quote. And therefore, how can they be charged with possessing unregistered Explosive material. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is not standard FBI or even basic police technique. This is a frame-up. Again, you see, there would be no reason to take fingerprints or test the chemicals to see if they would explode if the agents knew that their informants alone had planted the evidence. Jeff Randall, who has been gathering information on Starr's behalf, disclosed that the defense has lined up numerous witnesses who will testify that, quote, the only ones involved in the bomb-making talk or activity were the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms informants, end quote. Randall and Johnson also revealed that the defense has obtained a copy of internal documents from the ATF showing that the confidential informants were paid, paid, paid to infiltrate the group. It has recently been revealed that they were paid $50,000. As to Robert Starr's record, Although federal agents claimed they had investigated Starr for similar conspiracies in the past, the self-employed electrician has never been charged and has absolutely no criminal record. As to his character, Randall noted, quote, I know he's totally innocent. I wouldn't be hanging my butt on the line for somebody who was planning to make bombs. I don't support terrorists, end quote and neither does any other legitimate militia in this country. The Macon Telegraph quoted his former office manager, Linda King, as saying, 
quote, I don't believe there's a mean bone in his body, end quote. Over 75 militia members and local supporters packed the courthouse for the preliminary hearing and found twice as many law enforcement officers waiting for them. <laughs> what did they think they were going to do? Among their activities, quote, local, state, and federal officers snapped pictures as militia supporters quietly gathered in small groups under shade trees, end quote. Notably, the militia members snapped right back with cameras of their own, and well, they should. A few weeks prior, ladies and gentlemen, to the incident, the Georgian had told Randall that he was conducting an investigation into his militia and that he wanted to meet with him to discuss at a later date. Other members of Starr's group have told Randall that the two purported government informants were the only ones who ever discussed the illegal acts. But isn't it outrageous to suggest, and I know many of you are thinking this, isn't it outrageous insulting to suggest that federal agents would do something so despicable as to plant evidence on innocent people in an attempt to put them behind bars for many, many years? Actually, they've done it all before, ladies and gentlemen, and worse. In 1990, Ward Churchill and Jim Vander Waal wrote the COINTELPRO papers, documents from the FBI's secret wars against dissent in the United States. The name, the term, COINTELPRO, pronounced co-in-tel-pro, is a contraction of counterintelligence program which was, and likely still is, official denials. Notwithstanding, a domestic anti-dissent operation which apparently targets any group, any group at all, are groups that deviate too far from the establishment's game plan for America, which is to march directly into the New World Order, the New World Totalitarian Socialist State without a whimper. Remember, peace is defined by Lenin as the absence of opposition to socialism. The book used numerous references, including the huge spate of documents released during a brief congressional crackdown on our secret police agencies and others obtained under the Freedom of Information Act to chronicle federal law enforcement abuses during the 60s and 70s. The book printed one quote from Goldstein's Political Repression in Modern America, which has particular relevance to the Georgia case. And I quote directly from the book, Probably the most well-known agent provocateur was Thomas Tongyai, known as Tommy the Traveler. Tanyai, who was paid by both the FBI and local police, spent over two years traveling among colleges in western New York State, urging students to kill police, make bombs, and blow up buildings. He supplied students with radical speakers organized by SDS conferences in Rochester and urged students to participate in the weatherman, quote, Days of Rage, end quote, in Chicago in October 1969. Tonyai constantly talked violence, carried a grenade in his car, showed students how to use an M1 rifle, and offered advice on how to carry out bombings. These are from pages 474 to 475, emphasis in original from the Congressional Investigation on COINTELPRO. Tommy, the FBI provocateur, did the talking. The gullible, gullible, gullible student radicals did the listening and the dirty work. From the report again, Quote, after some students at Hobart College apparently took his, his advice and bombed the Hobart ROTC building and Tanya's cover was exposed, 
the local sheriff commented, quote, There's a lot of difference between showing how to build a bomb and building one, end quote. As a result of Tong Yai's activities on the Hobart campus, nine students and faculty faced criminal charges, but Tong Yai was cleared by a local grand jury and went on to become a policeman in Pennsylvania. See, for reference, The Agent Provocateur as Folk Hero by Frank Donner and The Issue of Civil Liberties dated September 1971. Political repression in modern America relates yet another of the numerous cases of FBI informants creating crimes from scratch. Quote, probably the most incredible provocation incident involved an FBI and Seattle police informer, Alfred Burnett, who lured Gary Eugene Ward into planting a bomb at a Seattle real estate office on the morning of May 15, 1970, by paying Ward $75, providing him with the bomb and giving him transportation to the bombing scene. Page 473. Ward, a twice-wounded, thrice-decorated Vietnam veteran, was, quote, shot and killed by waiting Seattle police as he allegedly fled after the bombing attempt, although he was unarmed, on foot, and boxed in by police cars, end quote. The COINTELPRO papers also exposes, with the FBI's own documents, very own documents, the case of Hollywood actress Jean Seberg, who was, according to a May 6, 1970 memo from FBI headquarters to special agent in charge of Los Angeles, quote, a financial supporter of the Black Panther Party and should be neutralized, end quote. Bureau documents reveal that the Los Angeles office fabricated a letter suggesting that Seberg, although married to actor Romaine Geary, was carrying the baby of a prominent Black Panther and that the letter was sent to the L.A. press. The Los Angeles Times gossip columnist Joyce Haver took the bait and printed the story, which reportedly led to Seberg's taking an overdose of sleeping pills, causing her to prematurely deliver her baby, which died two days later. Seberg, whom the FBI knew to be, quote, emotionally unstable and in the care of a psychiatrist before the operation began, end quote, ultimately succeeded in committing suicide after making yearly attempts on the anniversary of the baby's death. Gary, by then her ex-husband, also took his life shortly after her death. COINTELPRO Psy War techniques also included some ridiculous items, such as the anonymous mailing of bizarre one-page non-sequiturs designed to harass and destabilize the personalities of the targeted leader. For instance, one new left figure received a letter which depicted a crude sketch of a beetle with the words, quote, Beware the Siberian beetle, end quote. A cartoon directed at a member of the Black Panthers suggested that he was next on a hit list shown being crossed off by a government thug. And you bought the story, ladies and gentlemen, that when we called the BATF jack-booted Nazi thugs, that somehow we were the ones who were wrong. The COINTELPRO papers is written by apparent leftists and studiously fails to expose the simultaneous COINTELPRO targeting of the right wing, or the supposed right wing, what they call the right wing, which has escalated in the last five years. An illustrative example is from the early 70s when a segregationist named Byron de la Beckwith having been acquitted of the murder of black civil rights leader Medgar Evers, was targeted by the FBI for a ruthless frame-up. He was arrested while driving down the highway after the FBI had planted a ticking bomb in the back seat of his car. It was alleged that he was on his way to kill A.I. Botnik, a prominent Jewish anti-defamation league leader. Even though witnesses said he had pulled off the road, and slept for two hours just prior to his being arrested. 
the alleged ticking time bomb in the back seat apparently didn't cause insomnia. How do we know that he was framed? Well, ladies and gentlemen, last year, Bill Stringer, and I broke this story on the hour of the time. I read his transcript verbatim, first time anywhere. It was a scoop on the world. He was a terminally ill FBI agent, an agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Came forward. He admitted that his boss and an associate had framed De La Beckwith by planting the explosives in his car. I had obtained a copy of Stringer's October 18, 1995 sworn deposition before Judge W. O. Dillard of the 5th Chancery Court District of the State of Mississippi, in which he states that in 1973 in Jackson, Mississippi, quote, I was summoned to the office of Roy K. Moore, who was at that time the special agent in charge of the Jackson Division of the FBI, end quote. He claims Moore, quote, desired for me to assist Special Agent Tommy Webb in the case by assisting Webb in getting some sticks of dynamite into the automobile of Mr. Beckwith, end quote. And I read the entire transcript of this deathbed testimony on the air, ladies and gentlemen, testimony that was in a sworn deposition before Judge W. O. Dillard of the 5th Chancery Court District of the State of Mississippi, a legal document. Stringer refused, saying, quote, I absolutely would not set up Mr. Beckwith or any other person in an illegal manner, end quote. Moore then ordered him to do it and threatened to double his workload. Moore still refused, and Agent Webb's work was reassigned to him a few months later, according to Stringer. Quote, Special Agent Webb stated that he used a key to Mr. Beckwith's car, which he had previously obtained, and entered Mr. Beckwith's car, at which time he placed several sticks of dynamite, an alarm clock, and a battery on the floor of Mr. Beckwith's automobile behind the driver's seat. He stated that he then closed and relocked the doors to Mr. Beckwith's car, end quote. Stringer recounts that Webb then radioed to police to pull over De La Beckwith, who was falsely convicted and spent three years in jail for transporting explosives. Although he had opposed the plan, he kept quiet about it for over two decades. When Stringer finally began talking about the frame-up in recent years, he received veiled threats from fellow agents. Can you imagine this, ladies and gentlemen? This is not the FBI that I believed in when I was a child and wanted so much to become an agent of the FBI. I used to write happy birthday letters to J. Edgar Hoover. He used to write me a thank you letter back. This, ladies and gentlemen, is more akin to the Russian KGB or Hitler's German Gestapo. How many more such passive accomplices to similar crimes are there inside our secret police agencies? And don't you dare for a moment believe that they're not the secret police. Edward L. Bernays learned how to manipulate the minds of enemy soldiers from his work as a psychological operations specialist in World War I. You see, this is not new. Later, the renowned father of public relations talked of creating pseudo-events in order to better sell products or advance public affairs objectives. He even wrote a book in 1955 entitled, quote, The Engineering of Consent, end quote, University of Oklahoma Press. Now, in the nasty 90s, without various symbolic and even contrived media pseudo-events, the nation's change engineers would 
would be unable to properly condition the American public into hating the enemies of authoritarian totalitarian socialism. And that is the way they are going about creating a nation destroying world government. A nation destroying world government. A nation destroying world government. Consider all of the instances that I have just quoted to you of U.S. law enforcement's illegal tactics and the way they are used to mobilize public opinion. Don't you think it's interesting that although Robert Starr and James McCraney's arrests were accorded front page coverage, the explosive revelations of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms treachery were tightly blacked out from all but the local Macon newspaper and a few scant references in Atlanta papers? Don't you think it interesting that CBS News, the source of the widely dispersed report that the conspirators intended to bomb the Olympics, refused to retract the statement when it was proven to be not true? Check the Macon Telegraph of April 30th, 1996. CBS News stood by their story even when the Justice Department and defense attorneys refuted it. Might this be because the original source was, was from within the government? A, quote, reliable source, end quote. Don't you think it's frightening that although there were reporters from around the country present at the preliminary hearing, that you didn't hear it on the nightly news, or read it in the morning paper? Could it be that in order for a media pseudo event to achieve the desired psychopolitical effect, the full story must remain a secret? The loud lie has to resonate across the globe while the whispered truth is confined to the well-informed fringes and the masses, the herds of sheeple. Follow the Judas goat to the shearing pens and from there up the ramp to the slaughterhouse. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, an isolated incident. It is not. You may recall that when Ted Koppel told the world on the night of April the 21st, 1995, that an unnamed government source had informed ABC News that Timothy McVeigh was a member of the M Michigan militia. Do you remember that? You see, that was the loud lie. The loud lie. The loud lie. It took weeks of straining to hear the whispered truth before even a limited, very small number of Americans learned that the connection was bogus. You see, the FBI issued a statement that there was no militia, militia connection, that neither Nichols nor McVeigh were members of any militia, and there was no widespread militia conspiracy. But the damage had already been done, and mountain ranges of mendacity were built upon that one statement, that one lie. In fact, over a year later, that initial indelible impression still fuels the irrational and unethical smearing of the militia movement, constitutionalists, and the entire right wing. The dissemination of this loud lie has become a science in itself. Led by groups like the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith and the Southern Poverty Law Center and radical left 
experts like Chip Burlett. This country is now beginning to undergo another phase in the psychopolitical brainwashing process. Anyone who opposes the government's unprecedented encroachments on our creator endowed unalienable rights, or who fights blatant government corruption, such as the Vincent Foster, meaner drug running, or Oklahoma bombing cover-ups, is automatically and mercilessly branded as an anti-government extremist. Of course, what these very slick con artists and their shills in the corporate media fail to tell the trusting public is that the targeted groups are fighting government corruption. And the only reason they can be cast as extreme is that so few of their compatriots are equal to that task. See, most people, ladies and gentlemen, are cowards. And they know it. What the major news networks who interview these self-anointed paragons of, quote, tolerance, end quote, don't tell you about them is that not only are they intolerant, they are themselves radical extremists of the left-wing variety, or if COINTELPRO is any indication, perhaps even government operatives. As I have related in the June, July 1995 relevance, some of the anti-extremist extremists were exposed by liberal archivist Laird Wilcox of the Wilcox Editorial Research Service in Olaf, Kansas. You see, Wilcox wrote that Chip Burlett was, quote, a founding member of Chicago Friends of Albania, which acts as an unregistered agent for one of the most repressive communist regimes on the face of the earth, end quote. But Peter Jennings just had Mr. Burlett on ABC News warning that right-wingers were planning to use the Internet to facilitate heinous acts of sabotage across the nation. Unfortunately, Mr. Jennings forgot to mention that Burlett once wrote for The Guardian, the hardcore Marxist-Leninist news weekly of which Wilcox wrote in a March 1989 report, and I quote, a cursory review of its pages reveals hard, hateful, vengeful, and strident Marxist, Leninist, and pro-totalitarian content. Issue after issue rhapsodizes about the achievements of one totalitarian single-party state after another, end quote. But Chip Burlett, Peter Jennings' expert, is supposed to be fighting groups who hate You go figure. The enigmatic Mr. Bellet should know about totalitarian police state tactics and government officials who hate. You see, he contributed a guide to the FBI documents in the above referenced book about that subject, the COINTELPRO papers. <laughs> and when you see him on television, you think that he's an expert on terrorism, hate groups. white supremacists. Oh, what fools these mortals be. Another off-quoted anti-hate group is the Center for Democratic Renewal, the CDR in Atlanta, whose Dan Levitas seems to specialize in venomous assaults on the right, frequently heard on mainstream programs such as Nightline. Among the CDR's principals over the years have been the extremist left-wing radicals Lenny Zeskind, Lynn Wells, and Ann Braden. According to Laird Wilcox, Zeskind was, quote, on the editorial board of Urgent Tasks, Journal of the Revolutionary Left, publication of the small, Chicago-based Marxist-Leninist group, the Sojourner Truth Organization, end quote. Lynn Wells, a longtime associate of Zeskine, aligned herself with the Atlanta-based Georgia Communist League and merged into the October League. 
which in June of 1977 became the Communist Party Marxist-Leninist CPML, one of the most radical, hardcore, extreme left-wing groups on the American political spectrum. We will continue this tomorrow night. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. God bless each and every single one of you. Good evening. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap up what we've uh, been uh, engaged in imparting to you for this last week tonight. Many people, ladies and gentlemen, believe that this country's powerful elite have long used the divide-and-conquer ploy to polarize Americans along racial, ethnic, and religious lines. And that's absolutely true. Those who have come to that conclusion on their own are thinking right. The race baiters on both sides, ladies and gentlemen, have done such a skillful job of pitting blacks and whites against each other and blacks against Jews and Jews against everybody and American Indians against the world for so very long that it's newsworthy, not to mention gratifying when they occasionally shoot themselves in the foot as they have done on many occasions when they have called me a white supremacist a white supremacist. It is absolutely amazing that they don't even do their homework because as soon as someone comes to investigate for themselves and they catch a glimpse of my wife, they burst out <laughs> in laughter because they have really been caught with their pants down on many, in fact, most occasions. You see, I'm part Native American. I couldn't be a white supremacist if I wanted to be. And that's not all, folks. I'm married to a Chinese woman who's the most beautiful, most wonderful woman in the whole wide world, bar none. And my children, my two daughters, Pooh and little Allison, are part Native American, Chinese, English, Scotch, and Irish. As my wife says, they're all mixed up. <laughs> Jesse Jackson in the Los Angeles Times called me a white supremacist. An article on the front page of the New York Times called me a white supremacist. And uh, it is, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is amazing that so many people read these things and never bother to check and just believe it until they are so embarrassed to find that they have been repeating this when they finally meet me and my beautiful wife and my children, or they come to a speaking engagement where they hope to see the great white supremacist uh, and, uh, and, and uh, a boo and hiss and all that kind of stuff, and, and they find out that it's not true and that my speeches are not about white supremacy but about how we can all come together as Americans. You see, there is one... There's more than that, but there is one great unifying factor for all people of all races, all religions, all sources of ethnic origin, and that is freedom. Freedom, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what this country is all about. That's what our forefathers were all about. That's why they founded this great nation, to escape, to escape, ladies and gentlemen, from the religious persecution in the old world. Now, I'm not the only one that they have done this to and that they have <coughs> thoroughly been embarrassed because they have. Um, they've done it to many other people. You might recall that in the fall of 1994, the vanguard of the politically correct army descended on Mr. Ray Southwell, one of the leaders in what was then called the Northern Michigan Regional Militia. Southwell had been attacked by leftist radical Morris Dees. We call him Dees the Sleaze because he's a child molester. He's a liar. 
He is a very promiscuous person. He's also a homosexual. And uh, his Southern Poverty Law Center has been heavily funded by the Communist Party of the United States of America. And uh, Morris Dees claimed that he had met with a white supremacist in Tennessee. And uh, he was talking about Ray Southwell. This is a, a charge that Southwell vigorously denied and proved to be false. Nevertheless, the Southern Poverty Law Center and its fellow hate crime hustlers and groups like the Anti-Defamation League and the Center for Democratic Renewal attempted to paint Ray Southwell as a racist. And from that central canard began a smear campaign against the broader militia movement. Yet, Southwell, ladies and gentlemen, behaves like a very confused racist, indeed. It seems that he has spent many a weekend as a guest in the home of a black man named Clifford Brookins, who happens to be the founder of the Detroit Constitutional Militia. Southwell is a registered nurse, and he computes commutes down from northern Michigan to work in an inner-city Detroit hospital during the week. Now, this is not the most likely venue for a seething racist, ladies and gentlemen, because most of the patients in this hospital are inner-city blacks. Brookins, a 48-year-old building contractor, a black man, told Relevance magazine, the source of this information, Ray used to come down and spend the night here since he was being blackballed from his nursing job up north. When we asked Brookins about the discrepancy in Southwell's earlier media persona, he defended Southwell, stating, No, I know Ray is not racist, but psychopolitics experts at the Southern Poverty Law Center and their sympathizers in the major communist news network's media used the phony charges against Southwell as a powerful wedge to drive between the budding militia movement and the American public. Divide and conquer remains one of the most effective tools to keep the sheeple in their place. Nevertheless, the media scorched truth policy has backfired in yet another instance. Brookins told Relevance that he didn't know much about the militia movement until he saw it being excoriated in the press. That's how I got involved. When the media started attacking the militia, they said these people don't like what the government is doing. I said, hey, I want to be a part of that. These people are on the right track. He added, Quote, black people have been saying that for years, and now that certain whites are being targeted by the government, they're finally starting to wake up, end quote. Thus, media lies about militias apparently aided in the creation of what to the anti-hate industry is the equivalent of a cross to a vampire, namely a black urban militia founded on the United States Constitution. The final stake through the heart of that smear campaign came in the form of the Black Militia's alliance with what we're supposed to believe is a racist northern militia. As the current occupant of the White House is fond of saying, that dog won't hunt. <laughs> and indeed, that dog won't hunt. Brookins' discontent has grown from what he considers to be a corrupt court system, which refuses even to follow its own laws. He is optimistic about the prospects for a restoration of constitutional government. He says, quote, This whole country is going to wake up. People are at the stage where they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. End quote. Predictably, the media advanced the charge that Robert Starr's Georgia Republic militia was quite racist. However, J.J. J. Johnson, leader of the Ohio militia, who is black, told Relevance, quote, Well, Robert Starr has made a battle flag of the Republic of Georgia that has the colors of all the races of the country to show that all the races are welcome. There is also a black in his unit, and he happens to be a personal friend of mine, end quote. Still, the psychopolitical linkage of militias with racist continues. The CBS News Magazine's 60 Minutes in a May 20th interview with the author of the racist anti-Semitic novel 
the Turner Diaries repeatedly referred to it as the militiaman's Bible. What a mistake that is. You see, 60 Minutes once again shows its intolerance, not only for Christian sensibilities, but for the facts, for their information. The Bible of many militiamen who are Christians is the Bible. The Bible for many militiamen who are Jews is, of course, the Torah. The Bible for many militiamen who are Native Americans is their verbal history passed down by word of mouth for hundreds and thousands of years, and so on and so forth. There are even militiamen of Far Eastern heritage who carry the Bhagavad Gita to militia meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, you see, America is not about any of this crap that they're trying to shove down your throats. America is about freedom. And anyone who doesn't understand that is not an American, never could be. Anyone who only wants to hear what they say is not an American. Anyone who can tolerate only their church is not an American. Anyone who can tolerate only their race is not an American. America is about freedom. Freedom and more freedom, as much freedom as we can possibly stand and still be responsible for our actions. The government was created, ladies and gentlemen, for our mutual benefit and protection. The government was given limited powers. All of the other powers were granted to the states and to the people. In fact, all powers not specifically granted to the federal government, nor prohibited to the states or to the people, are vested with the states and to the people. That's the way this country works. And built into the Constitution for the United States and the Bill of Rights were certain provisions to protect the Creator endowed rights which our founding fathers believe that all people are born with. All people, even though this is the only nation where they really get to have them and practice them. But for how much longer, ladies and gentlemen, for many of them are already gone. Most of you already know that. Another black American who remains unbowed by the psychopolitics of divide and conquer is southeastern Michigan radio commentator Ron Edwards. In the late 80s, Edwards was the news anchor for WWJ Radio. He recalls being chastised for referring to the Nicaraguan Contras as freedom fighters during a regular news broadcast. This was the beginning of a rocky road in the radio markets for the velvet-voiced broadcaster who wouldn't bend his knee to the major media's political communist news network typecasting directors. Moving in and out of various radio markets, Edwards learned that for all their lips servicing of equality, diversity, and freedom of expression, the not-so-liberal news media holds some frankly racist views of the kind of political ideology black people should be permitted to espouse. Apparently, any views to the right of Kwesi and Funis are strictly verboten. That means forbidden. You see, the most oppressive group of people in this country are the left-wing socialists, ladies and gentlemen, the communists. If you really want to know the truth, they're the real Nazis. Nazi means National Socialist German Workers' Party. How about that? <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? You see, they just throw out Nazi, and then they show you a picture of Hitler raving and yelling and screaming. And then they tell you that Hitler killed all of these people and uh, that Hitler was right-wing. It's a lie. It's always been a lie. And any of you idiots out there who shave your head and call yourself Nazis, you're not right-wing either. 
You don't want freedom. You're socialists. That's what it means. And that's what you're involved in. And you're stupid. Haven't got a brain in your head. If you want to know the truth. It is amazing how easy it is to twist people's minds about and just totally screw them up for life with lies that nobody ever bothers to check. <laughs> oh, it is at the same time hilariously funny and unbelievably tragic, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to be the smartest, most well-educated people in the world. And yet we've all lost all semblance of even the basest common sense. Nobody reads anymore. Or very few people read anymore. Ever since the boob tube caught on. That's the big eye in your living room that brainwashes you every day if you're into that big eye. A recent study shows that the average American, this is the average American, ladies and gentlemen, the average American watches seven hours of television a day. Americans don't talk to each other anymore. They don't talk to their neighbors. They sit like zombies and absorb the brainwashing crap that flows out of the television set. If you ever really want to know what's wrong with this country, just go in your bathroom and look in the mirror. You'll find the problem staring you right in the face. <laughs> That's why I'm the most dangerous radio host in America. Because I tell you the truth. You don't like to hear it. But when you listen to this broadcast, that's all you're ever going to hear. Don't go away. I'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. In 1994, in a radio commentary on nominally conservative white-owned WMUZ, Edwards attacked what he called the Negro Thought Police for their evisceration of the Michigan Chronicle, a black-owned publication which transgressed the racial authority by supporting John Engler for governor. Remember that Edwards himself is black. He was promptly informed that his contract would not be renewed. You really think there's freedom of speech in America, ladies and gentlemen? There is. Only if you own your own radio network our radio station. And that's why we're doing this. You can, you know. You can purchase a satellite receiving system, a low-power FM transmitter. It's only $129. An antenna, true match antenna. It's another $36. Some uh, patch cords and uh, cable. And you're in business. Now... Now, once you've done that, you have freedom of speech. And that's the only time that you ever have freedom of speech. It only exists for the owner of the media. See, all this guy did was call into account the Negro Thought Police because they attack the Michigan Chronicle, a black-owned publication who supported John Engler for governor. And Edwards was promptly informed that his contract would not be renewed. He said, quote, When I was cut off from WMUZ, it wasn't because I did anything wrong. It was because when the socialist liberals showed up in great numbers to attack my views, I had very little outward support from those who supposedly share my love for freedom. That's why they call you the silent majority. You better stop being silent. You better start screaming from the rooftops. Your voice had better start being heard. 
Edwards laments, quote, The media does not want you to know that there are, are a number of blacks like myself who have a square root knowledge of what is right with America and what is wrong with America. They want blacks to only focus on the negatives, even when they say they're being positive, end quote. Thanks to years of subtle, Skinnerian operant conditioning, the mere idea of a black man in the pro-Constitution patriot movement has an air of incongruence to the liberals. It simply does not compute to these idiots. In the minds of most uninformed Americans, people like Ron Edwards are the equivalent of political unicorns. They just do not exist. But the truth is, they exist all over America. You see, they throw all this slave nonsense in your face and all this segregation nonsense in your face and all of this prejudice nonsense in your face. Ladies and gentlemen, hundreds of thousands of white Americans died to free the slaves. Thousands of white Americans existed in the South to form the Underground Railroad to help slaves escape the South to freedom in the North. It was America who struck down segregation. It is white Americans all over this country who have battled and fought for the real dream of this country, freedom. You see, you've been lied to for so long, you don't even understand it. It's amazing. You see, in reality, Mr. Edwards and so many more not only exist, but in Edwards' case, he is an active contributor to the independent press writing a column for the Unreported News, a popular bi-weekly news digest from Lansing, Michigan, while his Edwards Notebook radio spots are heard daily on WPON AM 1460 in West Bloomfield, Michigan. The veteran commentator sums up the broader national situation thusly, quote, I see us all, blacks, whites, whomever, going down in the good ship America with a hole in the bottom because of the government school system. There has been such a dumbing down that on a talk show once I was accused of aiding and abetting racism because I spoke of lowering taxes. The same goes for getting rid of government set-asides and the welfare system because people have been so brainwashed into thinking that it's been a help when it's been a hindrance. The ball and chain that is keeping them from walking freely down the road to success." End quote. Edwards is no dummy. He's an American. Edwards' strategy for success against the fascio-socialist onslaught, quote, a three-pronged approach, properly educating the younger generation, since the philosophy taught today is the one which will guide the nation in the future. Number two, we must adopt an honest money system and unshackle us from the graduated income tax. One of the planks of the Communist Manifesto. The IRS and the Federal Reserve System and its control of the money supply. Thirdly, we have to make sure that we don't eliminate one more iota of the Second Amendment's protections. Without that, everything else will fall like dominoes. We must by all means take the United Nations and drop kick it into Europe or some banana republic and eliminate our payments to it. Finally, the traditional family must make a comeback in this country. If not, America is finished, finished, done, over with, since historically a nation is only as strong as its families, end quote. That, ladies and gentlemen, from a black American, not an Afro-American, a black American. Recently, joint maneuvers were held in the southwestern United States involving a combined force of 53,000 United States troops 
and British soldiers, sailors, and airmen. The United Kingdom sent 27 ships, 57 aircraft, and more than 15,000 troops in what has been termed the largest British invasion since the War of 1812, when Washington, D.C. was occupied and burned. Of course, the Brits come in peace this time, but the maneuvers underscore concerns voiced by me and many other American patriots and militiamen about the gradual occupation of this country by foreign United Nations forces. As I have revealed in the past, as others have revealed, as relevance revealed in their article called Creating a Master, we now have a permanent British presence in Fort Lewis, Washington, which accepts the rotation of battalion strength British forces. As we revealed, we now have a permanent and expanding German Air Force presence at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico to add to the pre-existent one at Fort Bliss, Texas that you never even knew about. We have permanent foreign military bases on American soil for the first time in the history of this country. But you say, The troops maneuvering on the eastern seaboard are just British. They're not under the United Nations, right? Well, technically, it's true. Still, the maneuver pits the British-American force against a fictional outlaw nation called Corona, which has occupied northern Cartuna. And as USA Today put it, quote, got the United Nations really ticked off, end quote. (laughs) That's USA Today, May 9th, 1996. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not the United States or Britain that are really ticked off. It's the United Nations. As I noted previously, among our military brass, the United Nations is the single overwhelming presence which will increasingly dictate all military actions worldwide. For further evidence folks, that this is the United Nations intent. The uh, previously quoted United Nations publication, Our Global Neighborhood, cites Article 48 of the UN Charter, which states, quote, the action required to carry out the decisions of the Security Council for the maintenance of international peace and security shall be taken by all the members of the United Nations or by some of them as the Security Council shall determine, end quote. So the armies of any and all nations are at the beck and call of the Security Council to serve as at its pleasure, just in case old Charlie Krauthammer still doesn't get it. The book further stresses the United Nations' hegemony in the decision-making process. Quote, What is essential is that the overall United Nations control be respected even when a coalition command is set up, and that the Security Council determine whether any specific action should be entrusted to a condition or coalition of countries. End quote. So, ladies and gentlemen, even if a coalition command exists, as in Bosnia, the United Nations is still calling the shots. False reassurances about NATO notwithstanding. And that concludes our four days with this issue of Relevance Magazine. It was the issue of May 1996, Volume 2, Number 11, edited by my good friend Phil O'Halloran. And uh, I'll tell you how to subscribe if you wish to subscribe. All you have to do is call this number. It's 1-800-626-8944. I get nothing for this. I'm not selling this magazine. I'm just telling you because I know that some people will call and want to know. It's 1-800-626-8944. A regular subscription is $110. Once again, 1-800-626-8944. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, as I said years ago, And it's on record. Information, not money, is the power of the 90s. You better understand that.
Once again, don't forget to tune in this Saturday night to Chris Gurner's new program on the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. It's called American Exposé. It airs two hours each Saturday night, beginning at 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern Standard Time. I know you're going to love it. If you're an affiliate station, make sure you pick up his broadcast and air it over your station. And uh, don't forget uh, that Monday through Thursday night, beginning at uh, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, is Jackie Petru with This Hour Before the Hour of the Time. Jackie is just like me. She documents and sources everything. She has really done a wonderful job. She's making a name for herself, and she she has uh, uh, gained an awful large following already. And uh, if you really want to know what's going on in this country and in the world, you need to listen to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network and all its programming. Jackie's broadcast is one hour, immediately followed by yours truly in the hour of the time. And bringing up the rear is uh, a, an extremely interesting broadcast. And if you care about your health, if you care about nutrition, you need to listen to it. It's called Quest for Health with uh, Michael Cottingham. Uh, Michael is a, is a wonderful person. He, uh, he spoke at uh, one of our annual conferences. And uh, what he did is, on the way to the conference, he would stop just along the road. He didn't go into any fields or climb any fence. He would just stop along the road, along the highway, and pick plants. And those are the plants that he brought to talk about. And uh, what he taught us about those plants was amazing. I had never uh, known uh, any of those things or, or even suspected in my whole life that just by the side of any road are plants that can make a big, big difference in my life and in your life, in, in nutrition, in health, in medicine, in, in all kinds of different ways. And uh, I have a specific problem with my legs, ladies and gentlemen. I, they, I get tremendous pains in my legs sometimes, and I have poor circulation in my legs. And uh, Michael showed me some plants that... Uh, helps the circulation and gets rid of an awful lot of the pain. And then he showed me a natural aspirin that is present in aspen bark. And uh, if you just chew that aspirin bark when I have this, or if I just chew it when I have these pains in my legs, um, the pain goes away. It, uh, it helps the circulation in my whole body. And it does not have any of the side effects that aspirin does or any of the other uh, so-called pain remedies. And it's all natural. And uh, so I use it all the time. And I've learned an awful lot of other things from Michael Cottingham. He is one of the best herbalists that I have ever known. And uh, he's a good friend also. He lives in Silver City, New Mexico. He has a catalog that you can uh, get. You can call him and confer with him. And, uh, but one of the best things, if you ever get a chance to go and hear Michael present his talk on plants that he just picks up on the side of the road and drags in in a bucket, uh, you will be amazed. It is truly an eye-opening, opening, uh, educational, illuminating experience. It will change your life. It changed mine. Good night, folks, and God bless each and every single one of you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm William Cooper, and once again, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. This is the broadcast, and I am the man that President Clinton named in a White House memo as being the most dangerous radio host in America. Rush Limbaugh read that memo on the air in order to absolve himself of any of the targeting and the guilt association of the media attack on right-wing radio. He said, and I quote, See, folks, it's not me. It's this fellow William Cooper out in Arizona broadcasting out of a storefront. Well, he was right about me. He was wrong about the storefront. But it makes no difference, ladies and gentlemen. 
The reason that I'm the most dangerous radio host in America, according to the socialist in power, is that I tell the truth. I document everything. I give you the sources so that you can go look it up for yourself. And uh, in an era of political correctness, profound propaganda, <laughs> if propaganda can be profound, and uh, it is if you understand it, and just outright lies, manipulation, deception from every, from every direction, every day, from every source, Americans are bombarded with all of this crap. If you want to know the truth, if you want to be able to go out and look it up for yourself, you listen to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, and you'll be able to do exactly that. And then maybe for once in your entire life, you will know the truth and be able to separate it from the lies, the deceit, the manipulation. You will stop being sheeple and, <laughs> much to your surprise and great delight, I might add, you just might become real people. And if you can do that, we have a chance to save freedom. We have a chance to restore constitutional Republican government. And if we can do that, we can save the world. Ladies and gentlemen, when we got uh, wrapped up in this Bosnia thing, President Clinton told us that uh, he had signed the Daytona Accords to commit United States troops for only one year, and at the end of that one year they would be coming home. He lied, as he has always done. He is a chronic liar, a deceiver, a manipulator. He is a staunch, along with his wife, Hillary. Together they formed the first androgynous presidency ever in the United States of America. We call them Billary. He lied to us because the Daytona Accords, ladies and gentlemen, clearly call for a five-year commitment of United States troops. Five years. He also told us that our troops would not be under any NATO command or leadership, or excuse me, that they would not be under any United Nations command or leadership. He lied to us again when he said that. For it is not true, ladies and gentlemen. You see, NATO is just a regional organization of the United Nations. It is the regional security agency known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and it was formed pursuant to Chapter 7, Article 52 of the United Nations Charter. In addition, Article 53 states, quote, The Security Council shall, where appropriate, utilize such regional arrangements or agencies for enforcement action under its authority. But no enforcement action shall be taken under regional arrangements or by regional agencies without the authorization of the Security Council, end quote. Were you also aware, ladies and gentlemen, that the Warsaw Pact of the Eastern Bloc Communist Nations and the Soviet Union was also formed as the regional security agency known as the Warsaw Pact? pursuant to Chapter 7, Article 52 of the United Nations Charter. See, we've been scammed big time, ladies and gentlemen, way beyond your conception of what has happened. That's why Article 6 of the Dayton Peace Agreement that sent our troops to Bosnia stipulates that the United Nations Security Council will establish I-4, the NATO force in Bosnia, acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. The UN Security Council gets to decide if and when it wishes to use regional agencies like NATO and its American troops, and if it so chooses, it will use them under United Nations authority. And our troops are committed to I-4 in Bosnia for five years, not the one that President Clinton told us they were committed for. The NATO alliance 
was brought in being back in 1949 in its preamble states, and I quote, the parties to this treaty reaffirmed their faith in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, end quote. And in case there's any ambiguity about who wears the pants in the United Nations-NATO relationship, the treaty's Article 1 states this, and I'm talking the NATO treaty. Quote, the parties undertake as set forth in the Charter of the United Nations to refrain in their international relations from the threat of the use of force in any manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations, end quote. Charles Krauthammer recently wrote openly in his syndicated column that, quote, civilized society should disarm its citizens, end quote. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, his outrageous views are right in line with the United Nations. The Global Bodies Commission on Global Governance the name alone should tell you something, released its book, quote, Our Global Neighborhood, end quote, recently, which states on page 131, and I quote, We strongly endorse community initiatives to protect individual life, to encourage the disarming of civilians, and to foster an atmosphere of security in neighborhoods, end quote. Well, we never doubted that this was the globocratic agenda, ladies and gentlemen, but to the doubting Thomases, this might serve to open their eyes before Charles Krauthammer and the United Nations police come knocking someday to demand compliance with a voluntary gun give-back program. Our global neighborhood sets up a timetable of sorts by announcing on page 351 that, quote, our recommendation is that the General Assembly should agree to hold a World Conference on Governance in 1998, with its decisions to be ratified and put into effect by the year 2000. That will allow more than two years for the preparatory process. End quote. Notice how very dip diplomatic, or I should say, democratic it all is. The body's decisions are, quote, to be ratified and put into effect by the year 2000, end quote. It doesn't say if they are ratified. Of course, the preparatory process is just a code word for the engineering of consent from the United Nations would be global subjects. That's you and I. Now, for those to whom the whole idea of a psyops or psycholo psychological operation sounds like bunkum, we offer a recent report from the United States Army War College. Associate Professor Stephen Metz of the College's Strategic Studies Institute and research analyst James Kivett authored The Revolution in Military Affairs and Conflict Short of War on July 25, 1994. These military planners talk of a quantum leap in military technology and capability which enables a premeditated revolution in military affairs, which they label RMA. Karl Marx, after all, postulated that revolutions can be deliberate rather than inadvertent. Historical change can be created, engineered, and harnessed by those who understand it. This idea led many analysts to assume the current RMA can be the first deliberate one as senior military leaders and strategic thinkers consciously shape the future. That's a direct quote. From the report of the U.S. Army War College. The authors raised the issue of such new technologies as high-energy radio frequency, are HERF, H-E-R-F guns, and electromagnetic pulse transformer, are EMP slash T-bombs, and advanced techniques of electronic deception, but caution, quote, deception, while frequently of great military or political value, is thought of as somehow un-American, end quote. And I quote directly from the text of the report, quote, American values and attitudes thus form significant constraints on full use of emerging technology, at least in anything short of a perceived war for national survival. Overcoming these constraints to make a RMA in conflict short of war would require fundamental changes in the United States. An ethical and political revolution may be necessary to make a military revolution. End quote. 
perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, an ethical and political devolution would be a more appropriate term for this proposed step back into barbarism. These high-level soldier gurus seem impatient with the tired traditional ethics of us unillumined United States of America citizens. And they say this, quote, but there is another alternative. We could deliberately engineer a comprehensive revolution, seeking utter transformation rather than simply an expeditious use of new technology, end quote. Now, are the sweeping changes in military attitudes regarding the United Nations and the New World Order part of this utter transformation? And what kind of technologies could alter something so tangible as attitudes? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you the answer to that question is yes. You see, there could be no New World Order. There could be no One World Government. All of the things that are happening in this nation that conflict with the Constitution for the United States of America, and in fact, blatantly subvert it, could not happen without the complicity and consent of the highest echelon and the highest ranking officers of all of the military forces of the United States of America. You see, they are pledged to protect and defend the Constitution for the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And domestic. And domestic. And domestic. And domestic. I know. My father took that oath. My brother took that oath. I took that oath. My grandfather took that oath. His father and his grandfather took that oath. Metz and Kaivet note that information technology is more important in conflicts short of war, which are most often won or lost through the manipulation of images, beliefs, attitudes, and perceptions. This makes psychological technology much more important than strike technology. In a revealing reference to psychological operations directed against the public, they write this, quote, Ways must be found to use emerging technology, including advanced artificial intelligence and information dissemination systems, to help military strategists develop, implement, and continually improve methods of influencing opinion, mobilizing public support, and sometimes demobilizing it. But ultimate success in applying the RMA to conflict short of war hinges on the development of psychotechnology, end quote. And ladies and gentlemen, develop it, they will. In addition to the electronic RMA, the report reveals that, and I quote, the second and potentially more profound RMA is biotechnological, including genetic engineering and advanced behavior-altering drugs, end quote. Despite a smattering of disclaimers, the sky appears to be the limit for these elite military planners so eager to bypass Americans' ethical and moral standards. Now, I'm not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. These are our own military strategic planners writing this stuff. And if you listen to the vast broadcast of the Hour of the Time, where we revealed and exposed the secret mind control experiments, manipulation, and experimentation upon American people, then you know, especially if you looked up the sources and documentation that we gave you, that this is all, this what we're talking about tonight is kindergarten stuff. They're way, way far advanced, way beyond what I'm even hinting at here. The U.S. military has long been involved in psychological operations, but it is important to note its interlock with the bastions of social engineering, the tax-exempt foundations. You see, science of coercion reveals the extensive support from the Rockefeller Foundation and others given to communications research which focused on what the father of public relations, Edward L. Bernays, called the Engineering of Consent, in his book of the same name. 
He said, quote, the major foundations, such as the Carnegie Corporation and the Ford Foundation, which were the principal secondary source of large-scale communication research funding of the day, usually operated in close coordination with government propaganda and intelligence programs in allocation of money for mass communication research, end quote. Well, if they were the second, or the principal secondary source, who was the principal primary source? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that happens to be the Rockefeller Foundation. Although the United States military was the prime source of taxpayer funds released to the social sciences for psychological warfare-related studies, the targets were often the so-called taxpayers themselves. I quote, other U.S. Army and National Security Council documents from the same Cold War period stress, quote, plausible deniability, end quote, to permit the government to deny responsibility for so-called black operations and the clandestine targeting of the United States population, in addition to that of foreign countries for psychological operations, end quote. You see, that's what all this alien abduction and flying saucer crap is all about. In 1970, John Dewey, the author of our failed educational system, said this in a speech in New York City for the Imperial Japanese delegation headed by Viscount Ishii, and I quote, Someone once told me that the best way to unite all humanity in a one-world government and do away with wars forever would be if we were invaded from outer space by some other species from some other planet, end quote. <laughs> he said that in 1917. Unfortunately, they didn't have the technology or the means to fool the public into believing such a far-fetched scenario at that time. I can assure you, they do today. They are using it on the American and the world population today, and the sheeple are sucking it up hook, line, and sinker. Now, when all this took place and these quotes were made, it was the height of the Cold War. Now, the new realities of the 90s are upon us, ladies and gentlemen, and the U.S. military fancies itself to be in the middle of what Stephen Metz and James Kivitz of the U.S. Army War College have dubbed a revolution in military affairs. But the... <laughs> but for all of their fancy technology. These globocrats and their hired social engineers have relied on one very basic principle to bring them a continuous string of victories. It is the trump card in every match which is defeating all those who oppose totalitarian world government. That's why you never chalk up any points for the home team. Maureen Heaton, a friend of mine and an octogenarian who is descended from John Hart, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, has been fighting these globocrats for decades. A few years ago, she reacquainted us with the work of a long-forgotten army colonel named Tom Hutton. During World War II, he had been a public relations officer with the Flying Tigers in Kunming, China. Heaton wrote, quote, from that vantage point, he observed that something new had been added to the arsenal of war, end quote. Now, until the 20th century, nine principles of warfare, such as surprise, flexibility, concentration of forces, simplicity, were recognized by military strategists. Hutton observed that the Soviets and Chinese were utilizing what he termed Soviet Principle 10, or SPX, or what is known as the dominant principle, because it can pervade all the others. He called it, ladies and gentlemen, paralysis, or more specifically, paralysis of the will to resist. His extensive research on the subject showed that the Soviet Union had tested and used SPX on their own population before applying it to their military forces. 
In essence, the SPX is a psychological warfare principle which states that the enemy must be made to believe that resistance is futile. A similar oper operation is being conducted in the United States against American citizens, specifically known patriots, patriot leaders, and the militia of the several states and of the United States of America in order to call their ranks and frighten, intimidate, scare, if you will, anyone who might pay attention and believe this operation, that resistance to the New World Order, to the destruction of the Constitution for the United States of America, the Bill of Rights, is futile. It is a lie to try and convince someone who's had it so good, so much of their life. You see, most Americans at heart, ladies and gentlemen, are cowards. That's why they can pout. It's upon every opportunity to pat their sons and daughters on the butts and send them off to fight and die in some foreign, godforsaken country that they never heard of and can't find on a map. All the while, grinning from ear to ear, touting the patriotism of their children, and at the same time, will not stand up in the face of tyranny in their own country. In the first instance, they are cowards in that they send their sons and off, daughters off to die because they are afraid to take the risk of telling them not to go and being ridiculed by the media, by the press, by their neighbors. And in the second instance, they are afraid, saying, well, it can't happen to me. I'm not going to stick my neck out. Let someone else, let this fellow in Arizona, William Cooper, do it. Let him take care of it. Let these militia folk handle it. I'm not going to risk losing my job or my home. All the while, all the while, understanding full well that if things continue as they are going now, they're going to lose everything in the long run. Everything. You all know that. If you even make a cursory, even a very small investigation of the history of socialism and what happens to populations and people when socialists come to power, you will see that you are going to lose everything. You're going to become a slave, in fact, in the socialist system. You will reach a point where you will pretend to work, the state will pretend to pay you, and you will all drown your sorrows in buckets of vodka, just as the Soviets did for a couple of generations. Why does everybody pretend that everything is okay? Why does everybody look at what's happened in the past and say, well, it happened then, but it can't happen now? The truth is the socialists never deviate from their routine, their program, their plan, the way they do it. It's always repeated exactly the same way. And usually the people who support them the most and bring them into power, the so-called intelligentsia, the university professors, the journalists, the scientists, are the first ones eliminated when they seize the reins of power. Always. Everybody points to Hitler and the Nazis, and their crimes were great, and they were many I am not glorifying Hitler, I can assure you of that. He was one of the most heinous criminals in the history of the world. But yet, they never acknowledge the tremendous murder of the Soviet Union, the socialists, and the communist systems. 
Hitler murdered six million people, they say. Many people would argue that number, including many prominent Jewish researchers. But they never talk about the gypsies, the Christians, the blacks, and anyone else who would not conform to the new socialist order in Germany. You see, Nazi means National Socialism. They try to pretend that Hitler was on the right wing. Hitler was not on the right. He was on the left. He was a liberal. He was a socialist. He was a Nazi. National Socialist German Workers Party. Why do you let them get away with that? And why is it that everyone ignores that while Hitler may have killed six million in Europe, Stalin, Khrushchev, Gorbachev, oh yes, Gorby, when he was head of the Soviet Union, was still in charge of the murders in the Soviet Union and the labor camps in Siberia. Why do you all want to kiss him and tell him how great he is? He's not great. He's a criminal. He's a murderer. He's a scum-sucking, socialist, puke-faced pig, and that's the truth. If you read his book, Perestroika, he will tell you that the fall of the Soviet Union was a scam to disarm the West. And it's working, isn't it? He quotes Lenin, Democracy. Democracy. <laughs> democracy, ladies and gentlemen, is to socialist peace is defined as the opposition. Excuse me. Peace is defined as the elimination of all opposition to socialism. You see, I'm not making this all up. You can read it in the writings of the socialists themselves. That's a direct quote from the island. The orchestrator of the Bolshevik Revolution. How many people were killed by the Soviet Union that nobody talks about? Why are you still railing on Hitler and all of these other petty little guys compared to the Soviet Union? They're nothing. Nothing compared to Stalin. They're nothing. They're Sunday school kids sitting under a tree in the park. Because the Soviets ladies and gentlemen, didn't just murder six million people. They have murdered over a hundred million people. Easily. And I'm being very conservative in my count. Do you know why they don't? They vilify Hitler as being on the right when in fact he was a socialist, clearly existing on the left in order to demonize anyone who is truly on the right, who truly stands up for the freedom of all people. Because that's where the light really shines for freedom, is on the right. You see, the scale measures on the left total control by the state of everyone and everything, ownership of everyone and everything by the state, where the state is more important than anything else. And all the way on the right is the total absence of control. It's called anarchy. Both extremes are just as bad. But as you go more right from left, you are going into areas and people who want less and less control and more and more freedom. A constitutional Republican government lies somewhere just to the right of center on this scale. And that's where I stand, and that's where you should stand if you are truly an American. You see, this new world order that's coming, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be so much worse than Hitler and the Soviet Union and all the Stalins and Khrushchevs and Gorbachevs and Castros of the world ever could have been. They say power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
You see, we've never had a dictator of the world before. We've never had someone anywhere who had the entire power of the world in his hands. And I'm telling you now, that is where we're going, and that is what is coming unless you wake up. You see, the American people, the only ones who can stop this, the only ones in the world, they're the only ones who can still have broadcasts like this who can still seek out somehow and find some semblance of the truth. They are the only people in the world who are still armed and who still can stand up and form militias and protect their freedoms. And that's why the socialists are so keen and have amassed such organizations and such great propaganda campaigns to disarm the American people. Because there can be no one world totalitarian socialist government if Americans retain the right to keep their guns. And you'd better understand that. If you just tuned in, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the man whom President Clinton named in a White House memo as the most dangerous radio host in America. Rush Limbaugh, in order to get the critics off his back, read that memo on the air. Why am I the most dangerous radio host in America? It's because I tell the truth. I don't care who it hurts or helps, I tell the truth. I tell it like it is, I document it, I source it, I stick it in your face. And then you must deal with it. Even a cursory review of the events of the world scene today, ladies and gentlemen, might suggest to you that resistance is indeed futile, that the globocrats are omnipotent and that those who oppose them are hopelessly outfunded, outsmarted, and outgunned. And this is not true. And in upcoming broadcasts, I will prove that to you. If it was true, how come they got their butts beat in Somalia by a bunch of people who communicated with CB radios that they couldn't even find? And I'm not telling you that it was nice or wonderful or that it was good to see our people beat. I'm telling you our people should never have been there in the first place. They're not omnipotent. The greatest technological military force in the world was beaten by people with old rifles and CB radios. One of the greatest military machines in the world, the Soviet Union, was beaten in Afghanistan by a bunch of people with a very rudimentary education but the will to fight. Old rifles, old technology, no armor, no airplanes, kicked their butts. So this is an illusion that they cannot be beat. And nobody, no army in the history of the world has ever faced an angry American patriot populace on their own soil. And I'm telling you, that will be a terrible thing to see. There's not an army in this world upon the face of this earth that can defeat 100 million armed, angry, freedom-loving Americans. And that is the truth. That's the hard truth that these traitors are going to have to face one of these days, and it's not far off in the future. They will instigate it. They will start it. And I guarantee you, we will meet the challenge, and we will finish it. And we will restore constitutional Republican government freedom to America and to the world. You see, this is just another SPX tactic, and it's based on maintaining and strengthening this perception among the people who, if they didn't know any better, might all stand up and resist in unison. And if that happened, this would all be over tomorrow. It might be over before midnight tonight, if that were to happen. Rather, those who would resist must be led to believe that they are isolated in their convictions and surrounded by apathetic, cowardly fools or worse. And that's not true. In addition, the tremendous amount of information now available about the globocratic advance is overwhelming to most. Many people become paralyzed by the information and demoralized by the constant stream of bad news because when they finally discover what is happening, it hits them like a ton of bricks. 
and it doesn't stop. Only the strong survive. Americans throughout their history have been strong, pioneering people, and they will survive. The weak will fall by the wayside as they have always done throughout the history of the world. But there is no cause to whimper for them, for they chose to be weak. Fostering this perception of futility is the tendency of the independent press, especially some of the patriot media, to constantly overstate the seriousness of the situation. Thus, martial law or Armageddon is always just around the corner. To read these things off the Patriots' fax network and from the militia of Montana and from all of these other ridiculous publications that spread rumor, innuendo, disinformation, and outright lies is a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. All you have to do is pick up a telephone or do an hour's research in any library in the country to validate most of what they have or to determine that it is indeed false. In a recent poll that we did, by gathering up all of this stuff that's being passed around from hand to hand and mouth to mouth, most of it sheer idiocy, and by doing the research required and necessary, we determined, ladies and gentlemen, that in excess of 95% of all of the information passed from hand to hand, mouth to mouth, through the so-called patriot and militia community is false, phony, fraudulent, just outright BS, if you want to know the truth. And that must stop. Must stop. You see, what better vulnerability for the media and intelligence psychological warfare specialists than the current conviction by so many Americans that we are approaching the end times? Where does that come from? Do you really think the earth is going to end? Do you really think the universe is going to come to an end? That the sun is going to go out one day right on schedule because you believe it's going to? Oh, they want you to believe that, all right. They foster these things. They create incidents that make you believe that this is the end times. And the Bible makes so much no such statement at all. See, the Bible talks about the end of the age. The original translation from the Greek is aeon. The Bible clearly say, states that this age will end and a new age will begin. And how could you possibly believe all this crap being spouted from pulpits across the country and around the world that this is going to be the end of the world? The Bible doesn't say that. It says it's going to be the end of an age. It can't be the end of the world if Christ is supposed to come back if you're a Christian, if you believe what it says in the Bible. It says that Christ is going to come back here to this earth establish a new Jerusalem and rule on this earth for a thousand more years. Where do you get this end times crap? What's the matter with you? Why do you just listen so stupidly to these people who spout nonsense at you when all you have to do is pick up the book and read it? But you see, the powers that be want you to believe that this is going to be the end so you will not resist the tyranny that's coming. Do you really think that God would want you to sit back and do nothing while evil takes over the earth? I don't believe that. Not for a moment. I believe God wants us to do what is right in all instances, no matter what. And the right thing is always to oppose tyranny. You see, that's just a cop-out. Oh, I'm not going to risk my neck. I'm not going to get involved in this because I know the end times are coming and it's being brought about by the hand of God. And who am I to resist the hand of God? <laughs> well, you'll find out. That's all I can tell you. Because I can tell you, if you really believe that, you're a fool. You are a fool. And if you think that you could stand there and watch terrible things happen to your family and your loved ones and your children and not do anything about it and try and justify your inaction to me because it's being brought about by the hand of God, I'm going to call you a coward to your face. And if the enemy doesn't get rid of you, I might do it. So 
some of these beliefs and some of these excuses and some of these ridiculous reasons for the justification of the total lack of responsibility and action on the part of many Americans is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. It's a cop-out. Whatever your excuse, it's a cop-out. And most of you listen to this broadcast, you know I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the sheeple. The ignorant, apathetic, and in many cases stupid couch potatoes who throughout the history of the world, when any conflict has taken place, have always been the flotsam and jetsam cast about by the seas of battle at the mercy of the victor, whoever that might be, and of circumstance. And they usually suffer the most because they sat on the fence or they chose the wrong side because it was easier. You see, whether we are not in the end times, and I can guarantee you we are not, insofar as this perception adds to the paralysis of the will, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. How many Christians in this country have been effectively neutralized by their belief that the end is near? <laughs> you know, my grandmother taught me to have common sense, and I find that it's rare today that anyone has common sense. The argument is, why bother to resist that which mortal man cannot prevent from coming to pass? Whether the argument is sound or not, the fact is that many use it to explain their disastrous inaction in what should be an all-out political fight to preserve our basic freedoms. It is a cop-out. It is a lie. It is cowardly. The antidote to this formidable principle is simply to begin focusing on the good news, ladies and gentlemen, while remaining informed of the reality of the situation, which is the bad news. Those who still have no idea that there is anything wrong need solid doses of the latter, whereas those fighting in the ideological trenches are sadly in need of the former. Any development of forward momentum for the supporters of the Constitution and freedom would tend to short-circuit the entire SPX psychological warfare strategy and bring it to a screeching halt. Developing this forward momentum takes work. It takes work, luck, and yes, maybe even a little divine intervention. And a hell of a lot of risk. But nothing that's ever worth fighting for, ladies and gentlemen, has ever been without risk. If the United Nations is to become the policeman of the world, and that's not an if, really, because they are the policemen of the world today, and our armed forces is the police force for that policeman. But if the UN is to become the policeman of the world and to have its policemen all over the world, we are all going to have to get used to it first. There are few more powerful instruments for subtle, painless propagandizing of mass populations than motion pictures and television. For instance, in the 1994 made-for-television movie Death Train, Patrick Stewart plays Malcolm Philpot of the United Nations Anti-Crime Unit, or UNACO. He arrives on the scene of a terrorist incident in Germany. When he is told by the German policeman Captain Wolf that he can observe from over there, Philpot bristles, saying, Excuse me, what is your name? The German police chief introduces himself, after which Philpott states, Captain Wolf, I understand your reluctance to relinquish command, but if you confer with your superiors, you'll find that I have been authorized to lead this response. The then Captain Wolf asks, Since when do you people tell a German anything on his own soil? Philpott's pixie young American aide then chirps, Since 2 a.m. The U.N. policeman then begins barking out orders to the German personnel in the room who dutifully follow them. Wolf protests. 
These are German hostages. It is our problem. Phil Pot to an assistant. Miss Carver, patch me through to New York. To Wolf. There is a crucial piece of information that you don't know. The hijackers may have an atomic bomb on the train. The shocked Captain Wolf then receives a call from his superior, after which he submits to the United Nations officer. Now, this is just one little example. It's not a blockbuster film, but it serves as an illustration of the kind of blatant conditioning directed at the mushy minds of Americans. Unless people learn to spot such psychopolitical ploys, they will continue to be unaware of how their convictions were generated, and I guarantee you, they were generated. Most people alive today have never had an original thought in their entire life. And that brings us to the end of another broadcast of the Hour of the Time. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. I hope that I have made a difference. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight we are going to continue where we left off last night and uh, specifically talking about the COINTEL program and uh, psychopolitics, past, present, and future. The source is an article that appeared in Relevance magazine, edited by my good friend Phil O'Halloran. So, don't go away. I'll be right back, and we'll get into the meat of the matter. Psychopolitics, ladies and gentlemen, is the art and the science of asserting and maintaining dominion over the thoughts and loyalties of individuals, officers, bureaus, and masses, and the effecting of the conquest of enemy nations through mental healing. This I quoted directly from the Communist Manual of Instructions of Psychopolitical Warfare. Is there a method behind all this subterfuge and deception? Tradition might be a better word. The use of Machiavellian-style manipulations has been around for centuries, but it appears to have gone from an art to a science in this century. As socialist philosopher Bertram Russell once said of mass psychology, quote, Although this science will be diligently studied, it will be rigidly confined to the governing class. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. The use of what Stalin's secret police chief, Lavrenti Beria, termed psychopolitics, was covered in the January 1995 issue of Relevance magazine. Psychological Warfare in America was the title of the article. The above-quoted Russian textbook on psychopolitics was exposed to the public by former communist American Kenneth Goff, who testified before Congress in 1939 about communist subversion in this country. And uh, if you'd like a reference to that particular piece, see Volume 9 of the 1939 House Committee on Un-American Activities. In the manual, a key element of brainwashing was revealed. Constant defamation of the target population. The manual may well be one of the most vicious political tracts ever written, making Mein Kampf look like a paperback on pop psychology. To give a bit of the flavor of the psychopolitics manual, here, ladies and gentlemen, are a few excerpts. Quote, One of the first and foremost missions of the psychopolitician is to make an attack upon communism and insanity synonymous. It should become the definition of insanity, of the paranoid variety, that a paranoid believes he is being attacked by communists. Thus, at once, the support of the individual attacking communism will fall away and wither. You can find that on page 25. Propaganda should continue and stress the rising of insanity in a country. The entire field of human behavior for the benefit of the country can, at length, be broadened into abnormal behavior. 
Thus, anyone indulging in any eccentricity, particularly the eccentricity of combating psychopolitics, could be silenced by the authoritative opinion on the part of a psychopolitical operative that he was acting in an abnormal fashion. You can find that on page 33. The educational programs of psychopolitics must at every hand seek out the levels of youth who will become the leaders in the country's future and educate them into the belief of the animalistic nature of man. This must be made fashionable. They must be taught to frown upon ideas, upon individual endeavor. They must be taught, above all things, that the salvation of man is to be found only by his adjusting thoroughly to this environment. And you can find that on page 43. Religion must be made synonymous with neurosis and psychosis. That's on page 44. Degradation and conquest are companions. However, degradation can be accomplished much more insidiously and much more effectively with consistent and continual defamation. Defamation is the best and foremost weapon of psychopolitics on the broad field. You'll find that on page 41. The populace must be brought into the belief that every individual within it who rebels in any way, shape or form against efforts and activities to enslave the whole, must be considered to be a deranged person whose eccentricities are neurotic or insane and who must have at once the treatment of a psychopolitician. That's on page 42. An optimum condition in such a program of degradation would address itself to the military forces of the nation and bring them rapidly away from any other belief than that the disobedient one must be subjected to mental treatment. An enslavement of a population can fail only if these rebellious individuals are left to exert their individual influences upon their fellow citizens, sparking them into rebellion, calling into account their nobilities and freedoms. Unless these restless individuals are stamped out and given into psychopolitical operatives early in the conquest, there will be nothing but trouble as the conquest continues. That is also on page 42. The officials of the government, students, readers, partakers of entertainment, must all be indoctrinated by whatever means into the complete belief that the restless, the ambitious, the natural leaders are suffering from environmental maladjustments which can only be healed by recourse to psychopolitical operatives in the guise of healers. Page 43. By thus degrading the general belief in the status of man, it is relatively simple, with cooperation from the economic salience being driven into the country, to drive citizens apart, one from another, to bring about a question of the wisdom of their own government, and to cause them to actively beg for enslavement. That may be found on page 43. Should any writings of psychopolitics come to view, it is only necessary to brand them a hoax and laugh them out of countenance. Thus, psychopolitical activities are easy to defend. Page 34. Now, <clears throat> for your information, you may obtain the book Brainwashing, a synthesis of the Russian textbook on psychopolitics from Robert Brock. That's Robert Brock. P.O. Box 15288. That's Robert Brock, P.O. Box 15288, Washington, D.C., 20003. Just send $5 to Robert Brock, P.O. Box 15288, Washington, D.C., 20003. Just send $5. Tell them you want brainwashing, a synthesis of the Russian textbook on psychopolitics. Now, most Americans would find it hard to take these almost cartoonishly diabolical statements seriously. Edward Hunter, the man who coined the term brainwashing after he had witnessed it firsthand as a journalist in Red China, said as much before Congress on March 13, 1958. I quote, the United States is the main battlefield in this Red War. We need only read what the Communists themselves say, but we refuse to do so, exactly as we could not believe that Hitler meant what he said in Mein Kampf. 
End quote. It was during the McCarthy era, ladies and gentlemen, that the anti-communism equals insanity dictum began to enjoy mass propagation by not only political demagogues, but leaders in the fields of mental health and psychology. One brief example in a chapter on mental hygiene. George S. Stevenson, M.D., of the National Association for Mental Health, wrote the following in his book, Education for Mental Health, in 1954. And I quote, For example, a person who is continuously suspicious of others, who sees an enemy, perhaps a communist, lurking behind every acquaintance who differs from himself, is a person who is very unsure of himself. He will be apt to try to control the world about him in such a way that it will be least threatening, end quote. Now, folks, that was a fairly harmless example of the kind of soft-touch stereotyping directed at those who opposed communism. When this association between anti-communism and insanity is repeated ad nauseum until it resonates throughout society, what results is a subtle change in the public mindset. Soon, people who might have expressed these sentiments or opinions start to keep their thoughts to themselves. And before long, such discussions are considered beyond the pale of respectable conversation. Edward Hunter, who spent two years in the old OSS teaching psychological warfare countermeasures, told a congressional committee in 1958 that he first learned of the term brainwashing when, as a reporter in Asia, he spoke with a man who had escaped Red China. The man related the term Sai now or wash brain, Hunter stated. Whenever somebody said something the Papian government wouldn't like, a relative or friend was liable to say to him, Watch out, you'll get your brains washed. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? But the psychopolitics manual was written in the 30s, and all this talk about communist subversion in this country was discredited, along with tail gunner Joe McCarthy back in the 50s. Anyone who was afraid of a communist behind every bush was viewed as a paranoid, right? They're still doing that today. They call it McCarthyism. That's what they brand you with. Shame on you. You're finding communists. Well, the Washington Post, ladies and gentlemen, has had to admit that, lo and behold, there actually were real, live communists who penetrated the United States government hierarchy. Not just the exceptional Aldrich Ames Mole, but over 100 agents in many different agencies of the United States government. After years of keeping the information buried, the National Security Agency, NSA, finally released the fruits of its Venona program, which, according to the Post, produced intercepted, decoded Soviet spy messages with NSA notes identifying agents mentioned in code in the cables. The story was carried in a recent article by Michael Dobbs, which appeared in the March 6, 1996, Washington Post, a newspaper which has done much to ridicule anti-communists for decades. The agents identified in the documents include Lachlan Curry, a personal aide to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and May Price, the secretary to influential newspaper columnist Walter Lippmann. An agent known to the Soviets as Malad was identified as Theodore A. Hall, who helped the Reds obtain the atomic bomb. Nevertheless, the Justice Department has refused to disclose why it did not prosecute Hall. Other agents working for the KGB included former War Department official William Ullman, former intelligence officials J. Joseph Julius and Jane Foster, Harold Glasser of the Treasury Department, George Silverman of the Air Force, Nathan Silvermaster of the Board of Economic Warfare, and Harry Dexter White of the Treasury Department. All of those were named by Elizabeth Bentley in her testimony to the House Un-American Activities Committee. But you see, she was laughed off as a kook, along with her reformed fellow traveler, Whitaker Chambers, 
who fingered Alger Hiss as a communist spy. Alger Hiss is responsible, almost single-handedly, for the authorship of the United Nations Charter, which, when placed side by side with the old charter, I should say, Constitution of the Soviet Union, they are almost identical. Coincidence, you say? Not on your life. Not on your life. Alger Hiss is also implicated in the Venona records just released. The Post quoted John Haynes, historian at the Library of Congress, who has written extensively about KGB spying in the United States. Quote, This will be painful to many historians. Bentley has been mocked in many books as a blonde spy queen. These documents support what she was saying, end quote. So the testimony of Elizabeth Bentley and Whitaker Chambers and tail gunner Joe McCarthy's cause for concern was correct after all. In fact, Joseph McCarthy was absolutely 100% right. And it was because he was stopped in his investigations and the communists and the Marxists were not rooted out of government that they were able, over the years, to take complete and utter control of every, every branch of bureaucracy within the United States of America. What was the extent of this high-level penetration at that time in history? Lance Gay of Scripps Howard News Service wrote, quote, Transcripts of cables sent by KGB agents to Moscow in 1944 and 1945 were intercepted by United States cryptanalysts and indicate that more than 100 Soviet agents had infiltrated the State Department, Justice Department, War Department, Treasury Department, and even the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency. For reference, see the Detroit News, March 14, 1996, page 10A. So then again, doesn't this discussion amount to blatant McCarthyism? You see, in talking about this, aren't we politically incorrect? Isn't this a major boo-boo today? Aren't we in danger of being branded McCarthyites? Well, what do you think the respectable establishment in this country is engaging in by shamefully lumping homeschoolers and talk show hosts in with murderous terrorists? Of course, this doesn't make it right. What makes it right and necessary to candidly discuss all this is the facts, ladies and gentlemen, the facts, the truth. Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free. Nothing else can do it. On March 1st, 1992, the same Washington Post had to admit that despite all the scorn and abuse heaped onto paranoid anti-communists for decades by that newspaper and scores of Eastern establishment liberals, the Soviet Union was, in fact, directly funding Gus Hall's Communist Party USA. Independent researchers had found proof among the documents opened by the archives of the former Soviet Union. And I wrote as much in my book many years ago. The files detailed the funds sent by the Soviet Union to its communist party set up around the world and included a 1987 letter from Gus Hall to Mikhail Gorbachev, which began, Dear Comrade, I don't like to raise the question of finances, but when the wolf is at the door, one is forced to cry out. <laughs> Documents revealed that Gorbachev sent $2 million, and Hall sent back a signed receipt. Of course, shortly afterward, Mikhail Gorbachev became Gorby and won the hearts and many minds of liberal Americans and later used funds raised by the Republican National Committee and big business to open a Western office of his Gorbachev Foundation inside the longest-standing United States Army base in history, the Presidio in San Francisco. Further evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that the laughing liberals of the last few decades have egg on their faces is provided by Harvey Clare, John Haynes, and Friedrich Fursoff's 1995 work entitled 
The Secret World of American Communism, which uses the Russians' own documents to show the extent of Soviet backing of communist activity in this country. So the question then becomes, if they had at least 100 agents in high-level posts back then that we knew about and that we know about now, how many do they have now when we no longer believe they're a threat? And how many did they have over the years that we have never known about and probably never will? Aldrich Ames occupied a very high post within the Central Intelligence Agency. Do you think it's a paranoid fantasy to imagine that there are those in still higher positions right now? Claire, Haynes, and Fursoff noted at the close of their book, and I quote, Because Soviet intelligence archives remain closed, the activities described are but the tip of the iceberg, the now visible part of a much larger and still obscure secret world of American communism. End quote. Now, if that hasn't got you sitting on the edge of your chair, then I guess nothing ever will. Why isn't this kicking off a national debate and congressional investigations to determine the current extent of KGB subversion? Why isn't the press blaring this information on the front pages of every newspaper across the country? Well, because, you see, that would amount to McCarthyism. And besides, facts really don't mean much to people with closed minds who would rather believe something that is politically correct rather than look at the truth staring them right in the face. As Paul Greenberg of the Los Angeles Times Syndicate wrote about the NSA Venona files, and I quote, The latest cache of documents will not convince them. True believers are not daunted by mere evidence. There is nothing here they cannot deny, dismiss, or explain away. History, like a good suit, can be made to fit. That is their faith, that nothing is immutable, even the past. Funny. I don't recall reading this news story in the New York Times. I must have missed it. Or the Times did. End quote. Such is the effect of strategic psychological operations on the targeted nation's public opinion. This is why brainwashing expert Edward Hunter ridiculed the notion of a communist party when it is, in fact, he insisted, a communist psychological warfare organization. Former KGB insiders like Anatoly Golitsyn, would tend to agree. Although we quoted him before, it's worth repeating the words of Russian KGB defector Yuri Abesmanov, who discussed his former agency's efforts at ideological subversion, or what they call demoralization in America. In a 1989 video interview by author G. Edward Griffin, Besmanov explained, quote, the key to understanding the blindness is seeing that government leaders, the press, educators, etc., appear to be functioning as a part of a gigantic conspiracy, not because they are all under a centralized discipline or control, but because they share the same foundational philosophy and beliefs, end quote. You see, this slow process actually changes the way we all respond to factual information. Most of it, that's demoralization, is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to a lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, ladies and gentlemen, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. You see, a person who is demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Besmanov accurately described the intellectual invalids now masquerading as responsible journalists, bureaucrats, and elected representatives. He said, and I quote, They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. 
You cannot change their mind, even if you expose them to authentic information, even if you show them that white is white and black is black. You still cannot change the basic perception and their logic of behavior, end quote. Sad? No, ladies and gentlemen, it's not sad, it's tragic. And this may provide insight into the almost knee-jerk solutions to national problems which are recycled despite overwhelming evidence that they do not work, and in many cases, even worsen the problem. Some examples? Violent crime? Well, we have violent crime. Let's pass gun control laws. Welfare fraud? Oh, well, let's fund more programs. AIDS? Oh, my goodness, let's pass out condoms and syringes. Russian treaty violations? Well, we'll send them more financial aid. We see the same rigorously conditioned responses by journalists, our so-called experts, to talk show callers who make the mistake of asking a question with conspiratorial overtones. No more capable of restraining themselves than Pavlov's dogs were of salivating. They blurt out that remarkably consistent refrain, quote, that sounds like some kind of conspiracy theory, end quote. <laughs> of course, Ivan Pavlov rewarded his obedient canines. Likewise, the journalist who, shall we say, learns his lines well, continues to advance up the sleazy ladder of success, leaving his less compliant counterparts in the dust. And a similar process of natural selection was identified in Christopher Simpson's 1994 book called Science of Coercion, Communication Research and Psychological Warfare, 1945-1960. to This book shows that those social science professors who did not play ball with the prevailing and overwhelmingly government-funded opinions in the field of psychological warfare were conditioned to comply, or they were nudged out of prominence. Simpson writes, quote, In some, there were both positive and negative reinforcements for academics participating in U.S. psychological warfare projects. Among the perks, it is clear that use of government funding facilitated certain types of research and the winning of professional prestige that might not otherwise have been available. Among the pearls of nonconformity, quote, the price tag for scholars who refused to support the Cold War consensus could be quite high. Shunning by colleagues, firing, loss of tenure or prospects for promotion, FBI inquiries, hostile newspaper stories, or worse, even prominent academics were not exempt. FBI and U.S. military intelligence agents kept American sociological society conventions under surveillance in an effort to smoke out radicals. Charles Beard, the longtime dean of American historians and former president of the American Historical Association, was drummed out of the profession when he refused to readjust his work to the new political realities. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. The man that President Clinton wrote in a White House memo is the most dangerous radio host in America, and Rush Limbaugh read it on the air in order to take the heat off of himself. Even though to this day he still builds himself as the most dangerous man in America, that proved him to be a liar. Why am I the most dangerous radio host in America, ladies and gentlemen? Because I tell the truth. Simply because I tell the truth. I document it, I back it up with sources so that you can go out and obtain the exact same documentation. Why did he call me the most dangerous radio host in America? Because I know that Bill Clinton is a communist, his wife is a communist, and they are destroying this country with their fellow travelers placed in key strategic locations throughout the bureaucracy of the United States of America and the individual states. How else could all this be happening to us? How else could this nation be coming apart at the seams? Why has all this been happening? 
You used to blame it on the Soviet Union, and you were right, because the leadership always came from there. The funding always came from there. But you might say, even if there are a few quixotic communists inside this country still trying to fight the revolution with psychopolitics, how can they pose a threat since communism itself has been dead since the end of the Cold War? Well, you could ask that if you haven't been paying attention and you really don't understand what's happening and you really haven't done any research other than tuning in to the 6 o'clock news and listening to the lies from Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, Ted Koppel, Connie Chung, and all the others. You see, unfortunately, as crazy as it sounds, communism was never dead. And if you read Mikhail Gorbachev's Perestroika, he told you in there, he told you the truth, that it is a scam to force the West to lower its guard. Communism is in the process of being resurrected right to this moment, ladies and gentlemen, without rehashing all of our evidence. We refer you to the December 1995 issue of Relevance magazine, Planning for the Soviet Reunion, the January 1996 issue, The Changing of the Guard, and the exhaustively documented Fall 1994 special report, The New Lies Strategy, See also relevant March 1995. And hours and hours and hours of broadcasts of the hour of the time where I sat here and documented and read you the documents and the sources where you could get them over and over and over again for going on to five years now. The planning for a Soviet reunion continues apace with another big step in the left direction. On the Ides of March 1996, the Russian parliament voted for a resolution denouncing the 1991 dissolution of the Soviet Union as illegal. This is viewed, ladies and gentlemen, inside Russia as being the prelude to the quickening process of reconsolidating the old Soviet Union. The press may banter about that it is fractured into independent states and ethnic territories that have all become democratic and are being led by great democratic leaders. A quick review of the background of those so-called democratic leaders reveals them to be lifelong staunch communists. There has been no changing of the guard. This process was almost matter-of-factly predicted by Anatoly Golitsyn in his 1984 book entitled New Lies for Old, before old Gorby or his glasnost scam, also predicted by Golitsyn, had even appeared in the West. Of course, the reconstitution of the Soviet Union could never occur without the orchestrated sham breakup of the Soviet Union in the first place. Now that vast concessions have been extracted from the gullible West, and we are disarming and chopping our B-52 bombers into three parts in an Arizona desert, dismantling our Minuteman missiles and intercontinental ballistic missiles and destroying these missile sites. Oh, yes. Vast concessions have been extracted from the gullible West. Billions of dollars. We're beginning to see further evidence that Golitsyn was right all along. You see, the New York Times of March 22, 1996 revealed, and I quote, General Verinikov, who helped the abortive coup against Mikhail S. Gorbachev in 1991, warned an audience of Russian army officers last Saturday not to worry that Communist Party chief Mr. Zayuganov 
is, quote, sliding towards social democratic values, end quote, the general said the party still has a clear but unpublished plan. A clear but unpublished plan. A maximum program for restoring a socialist state which would be put into action after the elections, end quote. Maximum plan was the Bolsheviks' term for their long-term goals of creating a socialist world order. Maximum plan was the Bolsheviks' term for their long-term goals of creating a socialist world order, and the general's use of the phrase has stirred waves of shocked speculation among intellectuals and journalists. Why was Zyuganov's response to the general's comments? What was it? He said, quote, It was a slip of the tongue, Mr. Zyuganov said on Tuesday, insisting that there is no secret plan. And of course, I believe him, don't you? <laughs> Naturally, the vast majority of well-educated readers of the New York Times were instantly reassured by Comrade Zyuganov's clarifying statements. These trusting souls know, beyond any doubt, that the Cold War is over, and the Russians are all Democrats, even the Communists, after all. After all, ladies and gentlemen, they read it in the New York Times. Any doubt that the KGB psychopoliticians have a sense of humor was dispelled by the hilarious coup in August of 1991, in which the stone-faced plotters came down with bouts of flu and gave in to mighty Democrat Boris Yeltsin, appearing as himself in the unforgettable tank-mounting scene. There is no denying their gift for satire, not to mention showmanship. The only question is, how do they keep a straight face when delivering lines like Zyuganov's, quote, it was a slip of the tongue, end quote. Or when their brilliant young comic actor Vladimir Zirinovsky voiced his support for Pat Buchanan. Oh, man, I rolled on the ground. I almost died with laughter over that one. And when he did it, he, he granted his distractors one final embarrassing coup de grace with which to finish his candidacy. And he did it on purpose. Yes, folks. The KGB's Moscow troupe has been turning in Oscar-caliber performances for five years, but remains largely undiscovered, not only by Hollywood talent scouts, but also by Western journalists. Or maybe the humor is just too dry for American tastes or perceptions. Or Amer maybe Americans have grown stupid. Even if the psychopolitics technique are being used by resurgent Russian communists, we won't be affected by it, is the strain I often hear. Not so fast there, buddy. The Philadelphia Inquirer's August 20th, 1995 Sunday magazine carried a cover story cheerfully titled, Paranoid Politics, the blurry line between extremism and madness. In it, we were introduced to Gerald Post, a professor of political psychiatry at George Washington University and the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency's Psychological Unit. I read this directly out of his biography. The professor tells us that paranoia is part of the human condition. It exists in some measure, <clears throat> excuse me, in all of us. Yes, and it will exist in quite a few more of us when the full implications of political psychiatry sink in. Although the inquirer doesn't admit it, the concept of a psychiatrist treating one's political views raises the specter of Soviet psychiatrists treating dissidents. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't it sound an awful lot like the above quotes from that outdated psychopolitical manual from the 30s? But oddly enough, the Inquirer article provides the following little curio. Post is, quote, 
near completion of a book called The Psychopolitics of Hatred. <laughs> and I'll be the first one to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, when that book comes out. Ex-CIA man post, and I've got to tell you right now, there is no such thing as an ex-CIA man. Never was, is not now, and never can or will be. There is no ex-CIA man. Post is not the only doctor dabbling in political psychiatry. You see, the March 5th, 1996 edition of the Detroit News carried a column by psychiatrist turned neoconservative columnist Charles Krauthammer, which appeared under the heading The Paranoid Fantasies of Pat Buchanan. And after a long list of half-truths in which he attempts to show how simply crazy it is to think of the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization as threats to United States sovereignty, he closes the piece with the following line, quote, when I was a psychiatrist, I had patients with similar fantasies. Some even thought they were president. Not one, however, actually ran for the office, end quote. So Dr. Krauthammer has apparently returned to clinical practice as a psychopolitician, and he has diagnosed patient candidate Buchanan as suffering from paranoia. Only now he is sharing his patient's diagnosis with his readers across the country. But his disregard for doctor-patient confidentiality is surpassed by an even more reckless disregard for the facts, ladies and gentlemen. For instance, Krauthammer states, quote, The notion that the United Nations, a moribund, bankrupt, entirely dependent organization, threatens American sovereignty and independence is simply crazy, end quote. And he should know. He is, after all, a psychiatrist. Still, the notion that an organization which has gone from an international joke to the recognized arbiter of world peace and security in the space of less than six years is entitled to at least a little respect. And whether the good doctor realizes it or not, the world body has gained more than a little respect from our own military brass. The April 1995 edition of Special Warfare, the official quarterly of the United States Army, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, exposes the prevailing view of the United Nations within our military establishment. Listen carefully. The cover story is entitled, Ambushing the Future, and is written by James J. Schneider, a professor of military theory at the School of Advanced Military Studies, United States Army Command and General Staff College, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Schneider predicts that the future will be dominated by a resurgent force that will change the nature of both the nation-state and the national security system. Do you have any guess as to what that resurgent force might be? Well, folks, Schneider continues. He says, In other words, to learn from the past, we must anticipate the future, and the future will be dominated by a single overwhelming presence, the United Nations. The resurgence and the growing influence of the United Nations will not only affect our soldiers, but may change the very structure of the nation-state, end quote. Krauthammer laughs at the notion of a United Nations threat against United States sovereignty, while this army expert accepts our domination as a done deal. In addition, the United States Army even court-martialed a young medic named Michael New for refusing to wear the uniform of Krauthammer's moribund, entirely dependent organization. You see, the problem with articles like Schneider's and the case of Michael New is that they tend to undermine Dr. Krauthammer's diagnosis of Pat Buchanan's paranoia. Could it be that the good doctor is spending more time reading psychology today than he is reading special warfare and other journals that might better assist him in what his fellow psychiatrists call reality testing? He snidely notes that the United Nations has become a pliable, occasionally useful creature of American foreign policy. 
We send it into briar patches we wish to stay out of. Bosnia, for example. <laughs> this boob forgets that we weren't able to stay out of the Bosnian briar patch. Right now, this moment, as I speak, there are over 20,000 United States troops and 17,000 support personnel over there in Bosnia right now working for NATO. Krauthammer, a foreign policy professional and member of the Council on Foreign Relations, then makes a misleading distinction between NATO and the hopelessly ineffective United Nations. Presumably, he is unaware that the former NATO operates within the framework of and is subservient to the latter as a regional arm of the United Nations. As I have emphasized to you repeatedly, as I have documented on the air, reading to you from the law, from the treaties, from the United Nations Charter, from the NATO Charter, from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Charter, the regional security agency known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was formed pursuant to Chapter 7, Article 52 of the United Nations Charter. In addition, Article 53 states, quote, the Security Council shall, where appropriate, utilize such regional arrangements or agencies for enforcement action under its authority, but no enforcement action shall be taken under regional arrangements or by regional agencies without the authorization of the United Nations Security Council. That's why Article 6 of the Dayton Peace Agreement stipulates that, quote, the United Nations Security Council will establish I-4, the NATO force in Bosnia, acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. So behind Charles Krautharmer's back, the United Nations Security Council gets to decide if and when it wishes to use regional agencies like NATO and its American troops, and if it so chooses, it will use them under its authority. You see, you've been taken for a ride. When Bill Clinton lied to the American people and said we were sending troops under NATO, not under the United Nations, and that they would only be there for one year, he blatantly not lied. He lied. He knew that he lied. He did it intentionally. They are under United Nations command, and the Dayton Agreement specified five years, not one. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Please pull the wool out from over your eyes. Stop being sheeple and become real people. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you.